Hello, and welcome back to the 12 Days of Kizkit. My name is Brian, and we're really happy to have you back here for day three of the 12 Days of Kizkit. Once again, just want to let you all know that the 12 Days of Kizkit are running from December 1st all the way through December 12th and feature some really fun live streaming events from the entire YouTube Kizkit team. We're doing live coding, competitions, diving into the documentation, really and live. we will end the week as well with a uh, panel discussion from all of our YouTube hosts. Thank you again for joining. This day three is the second day of a two-part series all about Qpong and building the acclaimed game from scratch. Now, you may have already heard of it. If you watched day one, you definitely already heard of it, but making games is a fun way to get started in program. A lot of us already know that. Many of us have tried our hand at it before. Uh, and quantum programming is no different for that. Junye made Qpong in the Kizkit Camp 2019. And that's how he actually started his quantum computing journey. Qpong was featured in the very first episode of the very popular Coding with Kizkit series right here on this channel. And its Unity port was installed in a quantum arcade machine that went on tour around all of Europe, including the EU quantum flagship event in Finland. Now, <laughs> a pretty, pretty uh, uh, meteoric rise for this game. Qpong got Junye a lot of things. It even got him an invitation to CERN. Uh, and because, well, partially because of the game, but also just because of how amazing of a person Junye is, he joined the IBM quantum community team shortly thereafter making the game. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome our quantum developer advocate, our Q Pong architect, Junye Huang. Junye, welcome back. Thanks, Brian, for the awesome <laughs> introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming back to watch the part two of this live streaming series of Let's Create Q Pong from Scratch. Okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. And so before I get started, I'm just going to give you a recap of what we have done yesterday. So this is what we have done yesterday with all the files. So if you didn't join, you can go back to watch later. But I can just help you show you the current state of the game. Basically, we have drawn this uh, circuit grid and we can now input the gates. But this doesn't represent, uh, doesn't draw the quantum paddles based on state yet. We will do that today. And so you have this, uh, see here, there's a state vector grid. We took a quantum state of a three qubit quantum circuit. 0, 0, 0 to 111. And we have the classical pedal, we have the quantum pedal that have a pedal, each one corresponding to the quantum state. And we had a ball, but it just left. And that we also didn't work on. Uh, so um, I can also show you the final state so you know what we will do today. So this is the final version that hopefully we'll get to the end. So then you can see what's missing. So we will need to add the ball detection of bouncing from this classical and quantum panel. And also when the ball exit of the screen from the left or right, it should increase the score of the player. And also we should, the ball should reset at the middle. And we should also draw the score and the whole UI. And also the quantum panel should really uh, change updates based on the state of the quantum circuit like this. And you should also, when the ball reaches this area, you should actually trigger a measurement. So these are the things that we're going to do today. And also, uh, after you beat the game, you have reached the game over screen. So hopefully we'll get to do all of this in uh, about one hour of stream time today. So let's just get started Let me close this one. And Junior, just as a reminder for people that are following along and trying to code this mm -hmm. alongside you, what software are you using to build this? Yes. So the development environment that I'm using now is VS Code. You could use any other uh, software that you are useful, uh, used to. And of course, we are writing in Python because Skizkit is a Python package. And um, for this game, the dependency that we have is basically only Kiskit or Kiskit Terra, the core of Kiskit and Pygame, which is a game engine based on Python. So that's all about it. So if you're used to Python development, you should be able to set this up easily. 
Yeah, but that's awesome. a very good question. Thank right. you. Thank you. Take it away. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So let's continue what we are going to do. So as I did you recap, so now we uh, yesterday, the last step I did was to build a class computer, which actually controls the paddle to move around the, the ball. So what we are going to do now is to add a quantum computer. So we can just continue in this file. And we can add a uh, <clears throat> new class, quantum computer, quantum computer, and it's going to subclass the computer class, base class that we define here. And same thing, we are going to initialize this, and we are going to Take on the quantum paddles. Remember the paddles of quantum side is not just one, but eight. So that's why we add a pro S here. And the quantum computer should also take the circuit grid, which actually represent the quantum circuit we have. And we need this information to uh, determine the paddle position. So that's why we take these two arguments. So now we get the self of paddles and you'll be the quantum paddles. And remember that in the paddle class, the paddle itself is a sprite, but the quantum paddle is not a sprite, but the quantum board paddle dots paddles is a list of eight sprites. So instead, we, we won't take just this, we will take the paddles, which, so this self dot paddles will actually are sprite that you can draw on the screen in the game. And we also have score just like the classical computer, and we will just get the circuit grid. Grid equals the circuit grid. So that's how we initialize the class. And just like the class computer, we want to this quantum computer to do something uh, based on the ball. And so we can just define updates and self the ball. And in fact, the quantum computer does two things. And you actually control the quantum computer by and manipulating the gate on the quantum circuit grid. So what will happen is that we need to distinguish two states. When the ball are farther away, we are actually going to show the probability of the different states based on the simulation. And that will be before the measurement. And if when the ball very close to the quantum paddle, just like in quantum mechanics, you are trying to, when you actually do some measurement or when some things are interacting with each other, you do the measurement and the superposition will actually be triggered and measured and collapsing to only one of the state. So we need to write two, two methods to do these two separate things. And we also need to write some if statement to distinguish these two scenarios. But as a first step, we just care about how to draw this paddle based on the probability from the simulation. And then we'll worry about that in the, the measurement in the next step. So what we can do here is, for the first time in this series, we are finally going to use Kiskit. So we need to import Kiskit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you come here for this. No? That's great, <laughs> the main event. Yeah. So um, also, as I showed you earlier, that we want to reduce the number of dependencies of this game. So we only use Kiskit Terra. Well, usually you, when you, um, it, Play with Kiskit, probably install a meta package, which come with other things such as Kiskit Air. But here we only use the Terra. But even within Terra, we have a simulator that is called, you guess it, Basic Air. So it's a basic implementation of Air. And we can use uh, almost the same syntax to do that. So for the first thing that we are going to show is a state vector simulation. So we should use a state vector simulator. And that will actually simulate the quantum circuit and give you the ideal state vector that will represent the amplitude of the quantum state. And then we can build a circuit that is based on the circuit grid. And the circuit grid have a model that actually representing the circuit. So that's what we are going to do. And we use the compute circuit method. Um, so we can have a look what is actually happening behind the scene. So within this uh, circuit grid.py file, you can see that there's this method 
And what it does actually is just creating this Qiskit quantum circuit object, just like you're familiar with. And all this part, which is not very nicely written, <laughs> uh, yet a lot of statement, but I'll work on that maybe in the future. And, uh, but basically what it trans, it's just transferring the whole image of this circuit grid and the representation of this grid of gates in these wires and columns in these qubits and things to actual quantum circuit object in Qiskit. So that's what it does. And so when you do this, you just compute a circuit, the actual Qiskit quantum circuit that is represented by a quantum circuit grid to here. And we are you going to use that to do a simulation. But before that, as just like any other uh, Qiskit tutorial I've seen, we actually need to transpire the circuit because depending on the back end, they may not support the natively the gates that we use in the circuit, in the ideal circuit. So we need to transpire the circuit first. So what we can do here is just get a transpire, put a circuit, and also put the back end, in our case, it's a simulator. And then we can finally get back the state vector and it goes to simulator.run and we can put the circuit and uh, it should be transpire circuit. And then also special, uh, specify the short. By default, I think it's 4,000 or 1,000, but we want to make the game a bit faster so we can reduce the number of short. And in this case, we don't really care about accuracy and the sampling errors. So it's fine to be a bit smaller. So usually this, you do the run, you return a job object. But in this case, we want to write all this in one line. So we can get a result by dot dot result, and then we can get the state vector from the result by putting get state vector. So that should give you. Junier, is, is determining the amount of shots essentially determining the speed of the game, or do you have that somewhere else as well? <coughs> so, <coughs> yeah, sorry. No problem. In the game, you actually have the frame rate of 60 seconds. So actually, <coughs> excuse me. So, <coughs> sorry, I picked so up. <laughs> sorry. So, um, so each of the frame, so you place uh, this game 60 frames per second. So we actually have one over 60 seconds to compute this. Um, I'm not entirely sure of putting 1,000, we actually slow it down, but uh, 100 would definitely be okay. So Got that it. should be uh, giving you, so don't have a performance issue. Um, it. It's actually those three qubit simulations, so should, should, should not be a big problem. Yeah, <laughs> but that's a very good question. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right, so, of course, I've been typing this in here and you can make mistake. So where often we can use um, a Jupyter notebook or if you want to do it right here, you can use a IPython with which uh, interactive Python. So you can make sure all these are correct rather than running the game and find out the bug later. So what you can do is, okay, you do the same thing here, but you write it line by line. So we do a state vector. Simulator here. Oops. Okay, forgot about this. First, need to import Qiskit. And then second is to get a simulator and we get a circuit. So we are not going to use a circuit. We just build a very simple circuit. But similarly, it's just three qubits. So we can do, let's say, a Hallmark A and then a CX. Okay, just very simple one. And then we can see how it's true. So we just put a Hadamard gate and X gate, uh, control not gate. So this will bell state kind of, but there are three qubits. And so we can do this transpire circuit just like here. And then we can see how the transpire circuit looks like by doing transpire circuit control. So here you can see is that gate, Hadamard gate is transpired to a U2 gate and that is the natively supported by the state vector uh, simulator. So we can finally do this um, state vector equals to this one. Exactly, it was written here. And now you can see what the state vector is looking. So basically you return your array of eight complex numbers, and these represent <coughs> the amplitudes of this different state from zero, 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 
to one on one. So for this circuit, we actually put Hadamard gate and signal gate between the zero and one qubit. So we should have zero, zero, zero and zero and one, one, zero state and superposition. So that is what exactly what is coming here. So we just use that, just, just verify what we are doing. And so we can use this to print out uh, and use this amplitude to calculate the probability. And we use that information to set the transparency of the paddle, a paddle we have. So if there's no probability of getting that paddle, that paddle will just be transparent and you don't see it. Or if it's 100%, you'll be completely white. If it's 50%, you see like gray value, something like that. So that's what we want to do. And so what I want to do is something like this. So I want to enumerate the state vector in this array and we will get the basis state, which is the index in here, which actually corresponding to the state vector, uh, basis state in digit, but you don't need to take the word for it and you can see how it is. Okay, you can see this and to calculate the probability from amplitude, we actually need to get the real part of the amplitude and do the square. Oh, in fact, it's not real part. It should be just this. That should be okay. Yeah. And so you can see that we will have this 50% of the zero state, which is zero, zero, zero. And 50% of the three is one, one, zero. So that's exactly what we want. And what we're going to write here. So basis state amplitude weight of the state vector. And so we have the paddle which contains all the A paddles. And so we can use the basis state as the index. And each of these paddles have an image which represents the visual representation when you uh, join on the game. And you can set alpha, which is, is the transparency level. And so we can do this um, amplitude square is the probability and 255. This is the maximum level of the alpha. So 255 will give you completely non transfer So if you do this right, hopefully I did. <laughs> so this should implement the part that we are going to uh, show before the measurement. And let's go back to the main file. So we have to um, initialize the quantum computer. And it's going to be quantum computer, computer. And remember, we need to take on the quantum paddles and also the circuit grid. And then in the update game part, we should do quantum computer dot updates from what just like the classical computer. So if I'm doing everything right, let's just exit. So now you can see the paddle is drawing just like how I'm this circuit represents. So if I'm just doing nothing, it is zero, zero, zero. If I'm putting X in the first qubit, it means zero, zero, one. And if I put a hard mark gate, you have a superposition that you can see is half of the transparency. If I put one more, it become even larger, I have four paddles and even lower probability of each one. Or if you put three hollow market, you see all eight are possible, but they have only 12.5% of trans, uh, probability. And that is represented by the transparency. So we're all good here. <clears throat> and that's it, it was a genius idea to tie the transparency of the paddle on the right side to the probability. Uh, I, I just wanted to know if there was any story behind how you all got to that decision in the first place. Yeah, so that was the idea, actually, original idea from my mentor, which is our colleague, uh, James Beaver. So as I mentioned that uh, this game was created in the hackathon and my mentor was James and he had this idea and he already had the basic idea of using Pong and how to use the representative. So he has the idea, but I never got to ask why he think about this, but I definitely think it's a genius idea because it makes it so intuitive to think about superposition in this way. Absolutely. Yeah, because usually it's super hard to, to visualize and, and understand. Yeah. So 
I think that is really what makes Coupon so attractive. It's a simple game, but it teaches you something and it, it shows you what is superposition and what's quantum about. We'll, we'll promise our uh, live stream audience here that we will follow up with Jim and have an answer in a future live stream about where he came up with the idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All <Okay>. right. <laughs> so that concludes our uh, step of uh, step 10, I guess, step nine. Okay. So we added quantum computer. So, but we still uh, haven't added the collision between the ball and the, and the pedal. So let's go back to the classical pedal, which, which we always start with classical. So let's see what happens. Uh, <clears throat> so we need to add collisions. So we should go to the ball class and try to do something. So there's first we need to, what happens is that when the ball goes to hit the classical pedal or the quantum pedal, it should bounce. So let's just define a bounce method of the ball. And the bounce is actually very simple. Um, basically you can, so in the ball, we actually define a velocity vector. We have an X and Y components. So when you do bouncing, basically you just reverse the X components. So if you're going this way, you go the back. And the Y component, we don't change. So then we'll just implement bounce. And it's very simple, just self velocity zero equals to the negative of this. And of course, to make the game fun, we speed it up <laughs> by 50%. That's the key part. So each time you bounce it, you just speed up so that it just made the game more exciting. And then for the Y part, we can do the same. So we just need to replace the zero with one, but not negative. So we remove this one. So that could do the bounce. And the second thing we need to do is to do when we do bounce. So we can add that to the update method of the class computer. So we can detect when it is uh, actually bouncing. So when the bounce, you can use the Pygame method to actually detect when the two sprites of the one of the ball and the pedal actually collide. So we can use a convenient method that's from Pygame that already included. So we can do a sprite. I think we need to import, yeah, import Pygame here. <clears throat> so now we go back here. And he has a few different methods of using this collide mask. So all we need is to add a ball here and also the paddle. So this will detect whenever the ball and the uh, paddle collide. And we can just do ball the bounce. So that should be able, oops. Let's see whether that bounce now. So now we can see, okay, great. So when you see the ball, we can see again. <clears throat> when the ball hits the paddle, now we actually get to bounce. Okay. And uh, another thing we are going to do is just to add the reset because mm -hmm. you can see that the, now the ball is still in the top left corner, which is not what we want. And uh, <clears throat> so we can also add a reset that you, just to set it into zero. And also when the ball actually get out of the screen, we should also reset it and also change the score. But for now, we just reset the, the ball in the, cent in the center position. So we can add a reset method as well. And so that is very simple, just to set the X position of the ball, center X uh, equals to center of the screen. So we have the global variable for that. That is width, window width divided by two. That will be the center. So we can do the same for <clears throat> y position, but in this case, it's a uh, few height. So that should reset the ball. And we also want to make the ball, the game a bit more fun or fair that if the quantum computer wins, then the next time I reset, the ball should go to quantum computer side first. So we should also add a direction. And it's just an integer and we can use the positive or negative. So if it's positive, 
I'm just following the Pi game convention. Positive is more on the right. So we can just say that that would go right. So we can reset the velocity. Um, and make, to make the game a bit more fun, I just want to add some randomness to it. So I can add a random library. And I can just copy this part. So what I would do is uh, random integer two to four. This is the X component. That means it's going to go on the right positive side. And on the Y and uh, on the Y component, you have more, minus four or four, a random number. So that means you can go this direction. And we multiply it by our initial speed factor. So we can just uh, add it here. I add it as a, a different variable because uh, we could, for example, if later when we expand the game, we could select difficulty level and we can set this faster speed, maybe it's more difficult. That's Things clever. Like that. yeah. <laughs> okay. So then we can write the other side that uh, if it's negative, we can just do the reverse from minus four to minus two. And so when initialized, we can already just uh, reset. So for now, we can reset to minus one because the quantum battle we haven't worked on. So let's see what happens. So if I do it right, it should, the ball should actually initialize on the center, which is this, and then going back to the classical battle and bounce back. So that is nice. Everything is working as expected. Beautiful. Right? Nice. Uh, we have a question here in the chat before you, you hop into the next part. Yeah. Question from Unati. Could one, in principle, use the chasm simulator as a backend for the quantum player instead of a state vector simulator, or even a chasm simulation of a real backend? Yes, definitely you can do that. So you can run a lot of different shots, and then you can use that to um, simulate. Like, uh, the, basically, if you increase a lot of shots, you can actually represent the probability. So using a state vector simulation, you get the ideal distribution. Using the chasm, you just be almost like the real uh, computer that you have to sample. So you can also do measurement and each shot give you uh, something. And so um, it's possible. And uh, But ideal using the state vector is more accurate. It's absolutely correct. Uh, but in fact, that's a good question that, uh, so in the next part, that when we do the updates after measurement is when we are going to use a custom simulator. So that's just coming right after. Ah, so, some foreshadowing here. I like that. <laughs> nice. So we can get, so we're done with step 10 here. Okay. So the step, next step, we're going to add the collision with the quantum paddle. And that's quite a few things to do. So um, first thing we are going to do is that we will have to, um, <clears throat> first, we will need to add a new class. So a new method. So like I explained to you, this actually should be the update method before, before the measurement. So we can rename this kind of, so we can update before measurement. Excel. And then we can define a new one. Okay, here for now, we, we don't care about it first. So we can do update after measurement, which is exactly when we are going to use the chasm simulator. Mm -hmm. So we'll do almost the same thing here. And instead, we can go to the state vector change and change that to custom simulator. And then another thing we need to do is that in this circuit, we don't have measurement, so we need to add a measurement operation. So what we can do is to do measure all. That is a very simple method to add measurement to all the qubits. And um, here I'm going to run a short that is once. And instead of getting a state vector, I'm going to get a count. Okay, 
So similar to before, let's verify all these things that we are doing correctly in IPython. So we can do simulator equals to the custom simulator. Okay, I forgot to import Kiskit again. Okay, custom simulator and the circuit, we can do the same as what we did before. Circuit to Adama, zero circuit dot C zero one. And so the draw, let's just confirm we are drawing. Yeah, so this is what we want. And we do measure all, and we do circuit to draw again. And so we can see that we have added measurement operation to all the qubits by doing this. And uh, so we can just go ahead doing all the rest. Uh, it goes to transpire, and we can do count equals to this. So we transpire circuit runs run short, get the result and get counts. And we can have a look what the count looks like. So the count object actually looks like um, just a dictionary and with the strings, that is the bit string of result and the count. In this case, we only do one short. So we only have one result. Um, and then we want to use the count to actually, what we need now from this information is to convert this 011 to a decimal number and use that as an index for the pedal. So we know which pedal we keep and other cat pedal we draw transparent. So we need to extract this number from here and just need to do some trick in Python. And basically we'll get count stock keys, which get to get the 011 and we convert into a list. And this is only a list of one element, but I will still need to take it out. And I'll convert that using, because this is actually a binary number. So we put the two, meaning it's base two, and you convert that into integer. So it looks complicated, but basically that's what it does. So, um, so we do that here. <clears throat> So I will create a new attribute of this class that is called measure, measure state. And you just get this one. So we can verify here. What happens if I do this? So return three, because this 011 is three in decimal. So Not to take you too far off track here, Junior, but in <laughs> Kit, we read the binary from right to left, correct? Yes. So does that change how you have set this up? No. So actually the Kiskit ordering is confusing if you learn physics. <laughs> so the binary in Kiskit, just like ordinary classical computer binary, you read from right to left and the least significant bits are on the right. That's just the same as classical computer. But you'll be confused if you learn physics and you learn quantum computing because <laughs> Physicists, that's a two different thing. If you have a list of qubits from left to right, the first qubit is on the left. So that is what this keeps uh, bit ordering gets so confusing. But if you are computer science, this is like trivial and <laughs> intuitive. So, yeah. So it all depends on your background. Yes, so it all depends on background. But that is a very common confusion <laughs> of uh, people. Okay. So now we have determined what is the actual measure state after this measurement. We can use this information to actually draw the paddle. So, so we can do this in paddle. So first, before we set the paddle that's been measured to be fully like white, we set all the others to be uh, invisible or transparent. So we for paddle in this to get a root, we can set the alpha just like what we did in the before measurement. But in this case, we set a zero. So all of the paddles are now white, uh, transparent, means you cannot see it. But we can use the self to measure state. So this is the actual paddle that we measure. In this case, in the example we have would be the paddle 011. So you can set alpha and using 255. So this is completely non-transparent. So this is the update method before, this is the update method after. So we will have to update here, update method to see when we do this and when do we do this one. So in the game, I actually set a 
part is the measurement zone. When the ball actually go very close to the paddle, we will actually use this update method. So we can put an if statement and we can detect the X position. And I have a global variables here that is called with units. And it's basically divided the window by 100. So the window is 100 of width units. So I can use that to measure from left to right. So if I divide this by the global stop width unit, okay, I need to import it first. Then when it is very close to the to the state vector will be like 92%, more or less. And this you can fine tune, and this is the value that I already uh, decided. So it's around on the right, 82 to 88% to 92% of the screen, you actually trigger a measurement. So, um, so this is where we actually put updates after measurement. And otherwise, they will do updates before measurement. So that should achieve what we want to do. Let's get out of here. So let's see what happens. Um, okay. So it actually trigger measurement, but it trigger many times. Uh, so let's see. I just set the board to reset to the right, so then it's faster. So now you go directly to the right. Okay, let's see what happens. So you trigger measurement, I trigger many, many times. So that's still one more thing we need to do. So we need to do a measurement cooldown, meaning that, so for this condition that we added here, and as we mentioned that the game runs 60 frames per second, and just every frame you check this condition. So with, when this ball is between these zones, you just keep measuring. Um, but we don't want that. We want it to measure and then stay there. So we just uh, introduce some time cooldown. So once it measures, uh, we wait a few seconds before it actually runs again. So we can use Pygame to do that. We can use uh, current time. And we can get the time by doing this get ticks. So once we enter a measurement zone, we do another if statement to check that if the current time minus a new thing that we are going to add, it's the last measurement time is larger than the measurement cooldown time, which is a variable that I set here in milliseconds. So it's about four seconds. You will only you will do this, and then that will be the moment that you are doing um, the last measurement. So we set the last measurement to be the current time. So we just do the same get ticks, and then we also need to initialize this. And let's see, and get this one. And if you just get that, then the first measurement might be uh, middle happen. So I have to offset this a little bit by measurement time. So that means as soon as the game happens, this condition, the first time we already start measurement. So there's no problem. So we can see whether that that's what we expected. So now when it actually reach here, you only measure once and then it doesn't. So that is good. So that's what we want. And then another thing I think I just missed is that now we, when the ball gets out, I actually didn't reset it. So we should actually get that part done as well. So I think here, we should go back here to see the ball. Um, if we actually get out of the screen, if the ball, is less than zero, meaning 
you actually get out of screen from the left. And that's the moment that we are actually resetting to one, to a positive side. And otherwise, if it gets out from the right, and that is the window width, then self set to minus one. Okay. So now if um, okay, so now we reset again. So if I we get to wing it, <coughs> it should work. So it does trigger a measurement. And the last thing we need to complete in this step is that we still need to add the measurement trigger. I mean, add the detection. So now on the right pedal, it doesn't, even when it hits, it doesn't bounce. So we need to do the same thing we did here with the classical computer of the client mask. So we can just copy these two lines. If this one it is, um, but instead of collecting, detecting the pedals, here should be self to pedal, the self to measure state. That would be the measured pedal. So that should be correct. Let's see. So if I'm self to measure state. Mm, okay, I need to add here as well. So the measure state initialized to zero. And that should be, uh, once we get a, a trigger measurement, we should actually assign a value based on that. Okay, so, okay, not fast enough. <laughs> so I need to be very good to show you that it is bounce. Okay, yeah. So we actually get bounce now. So we should be done with this step. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I love that uh, as you implement the more, uh, you know, the more intriguing parts of your code, you got to be really good at your game to figure out if you're actually doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> After so demonstrate the features. <laughs> and if I'm not good, and just like yeah. Abe said in the coding of this game, this game is very hard to beat. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so now looking at the time, we have about 17 minutes. Okay, so um, we are almost done with the game actually. So uh, we just need to do some aesthetic things. So now we have this detection, we have the measurement, we have the cooldown. So now we just need to deal with more like game aspect of things. That is, uh, we need to draw the score, we need to update the score when that happens. Uh, so let's just go to that step. So um, to draw the score, we can use the UI, uh, which I already used before to draw the state vector. So I can, <clears throat> uh, maybe first I can update the scores. So when that happens is similar to the balls. So when the ball actually get out, if they get out from the left, meaning the quantum computer wins. So we actually need to increase the score of the quantum computer by one. So we can add uh, both classical computer, and the quantum computer as an um, argument to pass in when you do the update. So then when this is out on the left, we increase the quantum computer score by one, plus equals to one. <coughs> and for this one, we can see classical computer, the score, and that will increase the score. I'm gonna go back to main file, to add this back into this method to pass into quantum and class computer. And that should increase the score, but we cannot see it yet. So we need to draw it. So we, when we, if you want to draw it, we can draw it on using the text. So we need to create a new method or a new function. Let's go draw score. And we can take in the screen just like all the drawing method. We need a screen. And we can take the classical score, the score of the classical computer, and the quantum score, score of the quantum computer. So this one is just going to use a lot of um, 
Py Pygame stuff. So I'm just going to copy paste in, so to save you time. But basically, I have uh, in the resources file I have the font cards, which I already shown yesterday. We're gonna have a look again. So there's this class basically contains the fonts that loaded the actual source font, this bit five times three, what you can see in the already used in the stable category, and load it and then assign different sizes. Again, this width unit is 100 of the window width, it's just for using for scaling the game. And so we have defining different sizes for different types of fonts using in different places. So we're just going to take in here. And then I'm just going to draw the classic computer and its score, quantum computer and its score, and they're all gray values. And then there's some position. So um, if I'm going to back to here, I can use UI to draw score, and we need a screen and a classical computer or score and the quantum computer or score. Okay. So now you should be able to see. So if I do nothing, the ball goes to the right. Class computer should wings. Okay, yeah. So you see the score increased by one. And now <laughs> if I want to demonstrate the opposite, that is a little more challenging. Okay, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you can see the score is two zero. So the, so the score is working, All right? Junior, as you're and then, yeah. I just want to let you know, you have some huge supporters here in the chat. Guillermo says, go Junior. Barat is giving you a nice big hand. Maker saying, let's go Junior. You've got some nice emojis going on. You've got a whole fan nice. club here waiting to see how it all comes together. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's great. So the last most important thing is, okay, maybe I should ask a question if there's any. What is still missing? What is still missing is the most classic dash line in the middle that makes the pong a pong game. So we just need to do something very basic to draw a dash line. So we can, again, using the <coughs> UI, and we decide uh, create a new function called draw dash line and screen. OK, so again, this is, uh, yeah, just Python stuff. So. Um, it's easy just to this. Okay, I need to import Pi game. So what I'm doing here looks very cryptic. So I, let me go through. Basically, you just um, uh, we are just going to draw a bunch of these rectangles in the middle, and so we have this. Uh, I think just in the in the height, every tenth. This is the increments. And in the field height is where the pawn actually plays. And then two to a times of width unit is just the <clears throat> just the width, how how wide is the thing. We use that to contain the size of the rectangle. So we join the screen, color is great, and then this is the x and y position of this of the of the rectangle. So we can just have a look. Okay, no. I need to add that back to the main game. Here after this UI dot show that line screen. Okay, so now you can see we added this classic dash line in the middle. Okay. Yep. So with that we are almost reaching the end of this. So we should still uh what we actually need to add now, let me just save this step 12, I think, of this core angel. So the last thing we need to know is how to determine when the game wins. So for that, we need to uh, have these win scores, which are already defined on the globals. For now, I set it at three, so it's easy to, to see the end result. And also what happens when the win score is rich. So, if the class computer wins, uh, we have some uh, one scenario. That means you lose. Or uh, if your quantum computer wins, by that means you win. So we have we should draw different things. So we can do um, yeah, 
So we can just see how, how when to determine this thing. And so we can use that in the main loop that basically what happens is, uh, we can write some code, for example, if classical score is larger than Lobos dot um, the wing score, that means the classical computer wings. So we can write some new method called, for example, called draw loose screen because you lose. So it's called scene usually in game development. So probably we'll write in UI, so we can just write that and pass the screen and ask the wise if quantum computer the score is larger than global dot wing score. Then we do a wing scene. Okay. And that shouldn't be drawing on top of this. So that means if these two conditions are not met, that means no one is winning or losing, we should do the rest of the stuff. So that should work. So now we just need to do what happens when it's losing, what happens with right, uh, winning. So we can create a new method, new function here. Uh, let's do the lose, lose it because it is the lose in this game to show you that that works. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's also similar to this text. So I'm just going to copy paste because it's very basic stuff. Um, so same thing, I initialize the fonts and I draw a few things. Game over, class computer still rules the world. Okay, let's see. We can, so that means this is already implemented and this is not. So, but only if you meet this condition, we'll go here and they'll give me a bug. But uh, for now, we can just demonstrate, see what happens. Uh, maybe I change the wing score to only one, so it will be faster. So basically anyone that is winning one, then we should already get to a loose screen. So let's just do nothing and see the classical computer is going to rule the world. But it didn't happen. Why? I think it's set to greater than one instead of greater than or equal to. That is so true. <laughs> yes. That's exactly it. That's my Brian, one. Your, your eyes are very sharp. I'm all done. I'm now. <laughs> Boom. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So now we get to the game over screen and uh, it says these things. And so we just continue to implement the second part, which is wing screen. And I'm going to just copy paste the whole thing because again, it's just drawing some stuff. Uh, it's the same thing with some text, the size of the uh, and the color and then the position. So yeah, nothing really fancy here. And uh, so now comes the challenge that I have to win. So let's see. <laughs> If I don't win, I'm just going to uh, change the condition and make, well, make it draw mean, if I lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is, let's see. Kids could have been okay. leading up you to this point. Is this matchup between Junior and his computer? Ooh. Ooh. Lucky. Woo! Yay! That's a point. Okay, great. <laughs> oh, why this one happened? Ooh. Why it goes back? But it did draw the wing screen, right? It did. Okay, I think it did something else. Okay, doesn't matter, but we, but we have done it. So this officially, our game is done. And uh, we still have five minutes and I have to go show something. I actually prepared another more advanced way to do it, but I don't think we have time. So basically I can explain is that uh, in game developments, things like that in lose and win, that's why I already renamed it, it's called scene. So actually you have many scenes in a complicated, complicated game, you have many, many scenes. But even for this simple game, you have the main game scene, which is the game, and then you have win or lose. And you should also have a main menu. So when the game starts, you should be in a main menu. So in a more uh, sophisticated way to handle this, rather than just this, you have a scene manager. So you create all these scenes as different classes and different scenes, and you use the scene manager to handle switching of these scenes. So for example, right now we can, we can, what you can do is just 
to draw it. But what if I want to add that I press some button and I will go back to the main game. So that would be very hard because in this game loop, we already detect the present uh, button press. And it's very hard to actually enter here again to say something mm -hmm. and to go back to this. So um, yeah, so if you want to do more sophisticated things, then it would be good to have these game scene managers. But I would say now we have achieved after this two hour of live streaming, basically the home game. So there you have it. So we now we have, um, let's see if I can win, but probably I can't <laughs> because this game is hard to beat. Yeah. So basically we have a classical computer, we have a quantum computer, we have implemented the circuit grid and all this battle is drawn based on the quantum circuit. And I can even do something more fancy using, using the rotation gates if you want. So you can do Ooh. We can actually have four state or different things or <laughs> things like that. So so everything works as it is. And you also trigger measurement and give the game over. So um, so that actually concludes what we do. And but before we conclude here, I want to show you just a few slides that uh, just to show you if you're interested in quantum game development, uh, what you can do. So I'll show you one example of Kiski, a uh, coupon and that use a Pi game game engine so that we can directly import Kiskit. And it's a Python game uh, engine. There's also a few other Pi game and uh, Python game engine, but in general, Python game development sucks. So you, as much as possible, should avoid using Python package. And then, but Kiskit is a Python package. So how do you use Kiskit in other, in other non-Python development? So there's many ways to do this. One basic way to do is that you can set up a server that is uh, using Kiskit, uh, using the Python Flux uh, server uh, package that you can host all the Python things on a cloud server. And you can do all your game stuff in your favorite game engine like Unity or even Unreal Engine. And that's written in C Sharp, Lua or JavaScript or different game engines that you could do. And then you can just find some way to communicate with Kiskit writing your own APIs to talk, and then you can do all the things in the back scenes. And I have done that as well. And the third way that you could do is to use Michael Kiskit rather than Kiskit. So Michael Kiskit is a very basic um, minimal implementation of Kiskit in different languages. So it's not Kiskit per se, but it has the similar kind of syntax. So you could use this. Um, in your favorite languages and your favorite um, game engines and because it's implemented in many different languages because it's very minimal uh, implementation so it's very easy for other people to write in a new language to support so you can see sharp c plus plus godot engine is a very famous uh, popular open source game engine things like that and so actually i want to show you in coupon actually i show you just now three ways of making it and i've done it so coupon is Kiskit plus Pi game, native Python. Cubon uh, Unity is using the second way that I set up a Flux server. And the third way using Michael Kiskit is Cubon Pico 8. So you use a native Lua Michael Kiskit within the game. So you can go to check it out, different ways of making quantum game with Kiskit. And last but not least, I also have an awesome list of quantum games. So Cubon is by no means the only quantum games. And there's actually many games come before and after it. So if you're interested to check them out, you can come to this link and you can search awesome quantum games. So you should be able to find this. So you can find out if we actually have a very uh, vibrant community for people making games with Kiskit and other things. Yeah. So yeah, with that, thank you very much. That is amazing, Junior. I got to say, it's been wonderful just getting to be uh, in the front seat here watching you build everything. and getting to pick your brain in real time about the decisions you made, <laughs> how it all comes together. All right. Have... Oh, I'm so sorry. Is there any question or anything? Um, we have a lot of people congratulating you. We've got uh, people oh, congratulating you. About your work, saying it's an awesome game, throwing some claps out there. Um, I think people are really excited. Um, I wanted to ask you, Junye, if someone was watching this 
and maybe they're familiar with uh, Game Maker, um, or maybe they're familiar with Unity, or you know, if if they aren't fluent in VS Code for whatever reason, would you recommend they try to build this in their own engine that they prefer or their own uh, environment? That they prefer? <laughs> yes, it shouldn't be limited by um, what they are doing. So I explained in the last uh, few minutes on this uh, different way of making it. So you should you can write on your game on game development. And if it's not in Python, you can use some server that you can set up a right, very simple ways to do it. And you can always contact me if you need help. Or if you will use the micro gasket, you can just copy paste that file of the language that you're using and you should be able to do it. So some of the game engine actually come with its own uh, editors. So not VS Code, like Unity has its own, but the language is C sharp. So you can just put a micro gasket C sharp version somewhere and find a way to import it. That should work. And yeah, that should yeah. be okay. So awesome. Congratulations again. Uh, for everyone mm -hmm. watching, thank you so much for joining us on this two-day journey to build Coupon from scratch. I know I've personally learned a lot, and I hope you all have felt a little inspired to maybe try building your own game or uh, recreating exactly Coupon from scratch, just like Junie just did. You've now got this awesome blueprint that was laid out for you for how to do that. But this is not the end of the 12 days of Kizkit. No, no, no. We have plenty more coming your way. And I'm thrilled to let you know that tomorrow, Luciano and Abby, two of our amazing hosts on the uh, Kizkit channel, they're going to be going through Stack Exchange for some holiday gifts to find for each other. Luciano and Abby are going to attempt to answer as many Kizkit questions as possible from Stack Exchange uh, and Slack as well. They'll also take questions from the audience live and they'll teach you how to answer questions effectively yourselves. Now, this is something that is a key part of our community. If you are someone that is interested in the Kizkit Advocates program or just diving further in your own learning, answering other people's questions and helping the community out is one of the most important things that you can do. So this live stream tomorrow is going to be a perfect way for you to check that out. Now, before we wrap up fully, we do have one last question that came in here from Distilled Machine Learning. The question is, hi, I'm new to quantum computing, uh, but I am good with DL. I want to know if quantum computing has any practical application. Uh, for instance, can we build D apps, uh, but is QC helpful similarly? And I'm sorry, uh, me personally, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure what the DL stands for there. I think DL maybe means Deep learning based on the handle of this user uh, and build D apps or probably means deep learning apps, I guess, uh, which is completely outside of the <laughs> stream, but it's fine. I can take that one. So um, yeah, so of course, quantum computing can be useful for machine learning and we have a Kiski machine learning, learning libraries for that, um, but it's still very much on the research stage that you can check out some kind of proof of concept applications. They can check it out the tutorials and things. So a uh, building application in terms of demonstration is possible uh, for actual real life uh, business application, maybe it's still early in this uh, in this stage. So I hope that answer. Decentralized apps. Oh, um, okay. Yes. okay. See, that we're I'm learning. Not sure. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, don't worry about it. I, I think we'll look more into that. And if we find some good answers, we'll let you know on a future live stream. Uh, but until then, everyone stay safe out there. Junye, I'd love to give you the last word to everyone before we log off for today. Oh, just thank you everyone for tuning in and watching it live. And uh, if you missed the first one, you go back. Or if you like, I would love to hear from you. If you want to make more quantum game, let me know. Uh, if you need help, ask me on Kiss Kiss Slack. Or if you have a new quantum game, you want to add to an awesome quantum list, quantum game list, let me know. Or um, open a pull request to the GitHub repo. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.